Hello and welcome to Community Barriers, How to Advocate for Equal Access Within Your Community. Disability Rights Florida is Florida's federally mandated protection and advocacy agency. Our mission at Disability Rights Florida is to advocate, educate, investigate, and litigate to protect and advance the rights, dignity, equal opportunities, self-determination, and choices for all people with disabilities. My name is Barb Page and I am a lifelong advocate for myself as a person with a disability and for others. I have a Bachelor of Social Work degree from the University of South Florida. I have got over 30 years of experience working with individuals with disabilities in different capacities. Here at Disability Rights Florida, I've been a senior advocate investigator since 2001. And the areas of specialization of the kinds of cases that I work with include transportation, services for individuals who are deaf, service animal access, and overall Title II and Title III related matters. Have you ever dined at a restaurant only to find the restroom was not accessible? Have you ever gone shopping only to discover the store aisles were overcrowded with merchandise and there was no space for you to pass through? Have you ever gone and found no accessible parking? What about no sidewalk access? Have you been refused service because of a service animal? Have you ever been denied a sign language interpreter or other communication accommodation for your disability? The topics covered today will include the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title II and Title III defined and talked about a little bit more in details, service animals, auxiliary aids and services, effective communication, architectural access, goods and services, and some tips for self-advocacy. The ADA became law in 1990, which means that this year in 2020, we will be celebrating our 30th anniversary of the passage of the ADA. It is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in really all areas of, of life, including employment, transportation, shopping, going to entertainment, really any place that is open to the general public. And really, ultimately, the purpose of the law is to ensure that people with disabilities have the same rights, opportunities, and access as everyone else. These are the titles of the ADA. Title I covers employment. Title II are all your public services, state and local government. Title III is public accommodations and services operated by private entities. That would include your stores, your movie theaters, your restaurants, those kinds of places. Title IV is telecommunications and Title V is miscellaneous. For this presentation, we will be focusing primarily on Title II and Title III entities. Title II prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability by local and state government, and they must make their facilities, programs, and services accessible. Some examples of Title II entities are airports, hospitals, and public transportation. Public entities have requirements under the ADA for creating self-evaluation surveys and transition plans to address and ensure equal access. Title III of the ADA prohibits places of public accommodations from discriminating against people with disabilities, including businesses that are privately owned, such as hotels, restaurants, stores, doctors and dentist offices, golf courses, sports stadiums, movie or performing arts theaters, basically any place the general public is permitted to go. Title III also sets the minimum standards for accessibility, including alterations and new construction to commercial facilities or privately owned businesses. Title III also requires public accommodations to remove barriers in existing buildings where it is readily achievable to do so or without too much difficulty or expense. Title III entities must also make reasonable modifications to the usual ways of doing things when they provide services to their customers or their patrons. For example, 
if your store typically does not allow animals into the store, the person with a service animal would be allowed access into the store with a service dog. Also, individuals who might have a vision, hearing, or speech disability, that business has an obligation to provide a, an accommodation or modification by providing services. For example, they could read a menu to the person who could not read the menu because of a vision disability. Under the ADA, service animals are defined as dogs and sometimes miniature horses that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. Service animals are working animals, not pets. The work or the task that the dog has been trained to provide must be directly related to the person's disability. If a dog's sole function is to provide comfort or emotional support to the individual, it does not qualify as a service animal under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Under federal and Florida statutes, those covered under Titles II and Title III must allow service animals to accompany people with disabilities in all areas of the facility where the public is normally allowed to go. Service animals must be harnessed, leashed, or tethered and must remain under control of its handler through effective controls. When it is not obvious what the service animal provides, there are only two questions allowed to be asked. A staff person may ask, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And two, what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? The staff members cannot ask about the person's disability, require medical documentation, ask for special identification or certification of the dog's training. A public accommodation shall take those steps necessary to ensure an individual with a disability is not excluded, denied services, segregated, or otherwise treated differently than other individuals because of the absence of aids and services unless the public accommodation can demonstrate that taking those steps would fundamentally alter the nature of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations being offered or would result in an undue burden which means significantly difficult or expensive. For individuals who are blind or have vision loss, auxiliary aids could include large print materials, braille, or electronically based materials that can be utilized with a computer screen reading program. For individuals who have speech disabilities, a qualified speech-to-speech -speech transliterator can be a, an accommodation. A communication board or additional time for communication would also be examples of appropriate auxiliary aids and services. For people who are deaf or have hearing loss, examples of appropriate auxiliary aids and services would include sign language interpreters, oral or tactile interpreters, captioning, assistive listening devices, or written materials. Video remote interpreting, known as VRI, is a fee-based service that uses video conferencing technology to access off-site, real-time sign language interpreting services. Effective communication. People who have vision, hearing, or speech disabilities may use different ways to communicate. People who are blind may give and receive information audibly rather than writing. People who are deaf may give and receive information through writing or sign language rather than through speech. Providing accommodations to ensure effective communication is required under both Titles II and Title III of the ADA. The end goal is to ensure communication with individuals who have vision, hearing, or speech disabilities are equally effective as those without disabilities. Accommodations and modifications ensure someone with a vision, speech, or hearing disability can communicate with, receive information from, and convey information. 
Entities under Title II and Title III, which are state and local government and places of public accommodation, must provide auxiliary aids and services when needed to communicate effectively with people who have communication disabilities. This also would extend to parents, spouses, or companions in appropriate circumstances. The key to communicating effectively is really to consider the nature, the length, and the complexity and the context of the communication and the person's normal method of communication. For example, if someone who is deaf communicates primarily through American Sign Language, but is just going to buy a hamburger at a fast food restaurant, they may not need an interpreter for that transaction. However, the same person goes to a medical doctor's appointment and wants to discuss with their doctor some problems or get some results from some tests. That would require an American Sign Language interpreter to truly make sure that effective communication is going both ways. It would be considered a more complex conversation and therefore would require possibly more than just writing notes back and forth. Great, let's talk about architectural access and we have several slides to go through. We'll be talking about the federal ADA standards for accessible design versus the Florida Accessibility Code and then some of the differences. When the ADA was passed, specific guidance was provided for architectural design for example, the slope of a ramp, the width of an accessible parking space, the size of a bathroom stall that would accommodate a wheelchair user. In 2010, the Department of Justice published revised regulations for Titles 2 and 3 of the ADA. These 2010 standards set minimum requirements for newly designed and constructed facilities. The Florida Accessibility Code for Building Construction mirrors very closely the ADA standards for newly constructed and revised facilities. In Florida, the Florida Accessibility Codes are the standards for which building officials use to sign off on permits to indicate that construction is completed appropriately and in compliance. While the Florida Accessibility Code and the ADA standards are nearly identical, there are just a few specifics that differ. Parking, for example, public restrooms, and vertical accessibility are all a little bit different. In Florida, all accessible parking spaces are to be van accessible, which means all parking spaces are 12 feet wide with a 5 foot wide access aisle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. In Florida, new construction for public restrooms must have a lavatory or sink, as it's known, within the accessible stall. Finally, the vertical accessibility requirement means that a newly constructed building must have access to all levels where the public goes. For example, imagine a newly constructed beachfront restaurant that has accessible indoor dining downstairs, but also has a beautiful rooftop deck overlooking the beach where it also has dining. There must be a means for an individual with a disability to gain access to that same area. Accessible route, approach, and entrance. When we think about accessibility for, individ for individuals with disabilities within the community, one of the very first things that's needed is an accessible route into the building, whether it's from the public sidewalk or the parking area. The accessible route should have ramps or curb cuts, be stable and have firm surfaces, and be a minimum of 36 inches wide for passage. Protruding objects must be placed either high enough not to have someone bump their head into them or be close enough to the floor to be easily detected by a cane for someone who is blind. Generally, this slide will provide you with the number of accessible parking spots as compared to the whole parking area. Accessible parking spaces serving a particular building should be on the closest, safest, and most accessible route Again, in Florida, each parking space must be 12 feet wide and must have an adjacent 5 foot wide access aisle. Accessible parking spaces for persons with disabilities are outlined in blue paint. The parking space should also be fairly level as we don't want the parking space to be on a hill or, or uneven ground. 
The access aisles are designed to allow space for a wheelchair lift to be deployed or allows extra space for someone to help someone else out of their car. The five foot access aisle is typically outlined in white and has diagonal stripes throughout. Diagonal stripes designate no parking and hence no one should park in these access aisles. Even if the vehicle has the license plate or parking placard allowing for uh, permission to park in a accessible parking space, parking in the access aisle is never permitted. If you park in an access aisle, you are at risk for being ticketed even if you have the accessible permit to do so. It's also important for all of us to avoid access aisles as a drop-off zone for shopping carts which is often done and really prohibits the use of the aisle as it is intended. Signage is required for accessible parking spaces with above grade signs necessary to make this space a designated space for accessible parking. The sign will have the international symbol of accessibility, which is the blue background with the white wheelchair silhouette. The sign must have language indicating it is a parking space for those with the appropriate disabled parking permit and any fines designated by the local ordinance. Goods and services. Let's talk about places of public accommodation, which are stores, restaurants, or movie theaters. Basically, a public place where everyone can enter. The path within the space, be it a store aisle or a dining room, there should be a and remain a 36 inch space for which to travel. Many times we will see this is not the case, some restaurant tables are so close together, there is not space to pass in between each table. However, there should remain at least one path leading to an area of tables that are accessible and also the path to the restroom. The restroom area often will be separated from the dining room and often extra dining chairs or high chairs or for infants are stored there. There must be a clear floor area allowing a 36 inch passageway. I have I've had to ask for wait staff to move items for me in the past for me to get through with my wheelchair. While the staff will do so, I will always follow up with a conversation with the manager after the fact to inform them of the problem and make strong suggestions they find alternative storage space that does not block the path or the restroom area. Restrooms and fitting rooms should be accessible. Not all have to be, but at least one. High top tables are very popular at the moment and the restaurant should offer a variety of table heights and lower tables for those of us who cannot use the high top tables. It's not that they aren't allowed to have high top tables, they simply must have a variety. If you are a person with a disability and drive your own vehicle, sometimes putting gas in the vehicle is a real challenge. The ADA and Florida statute requires refueling assistance to individuals with disabilities. The attendant may not be able to provide assistance if they are if they're the only person on duty. In Florida, the phone number into the gas station should be posted on every gas pump so the individual can call inside and alert the employee that they are an individual with a disability and they're requesting assistance for pumping gas. Movie theaters, arenas, concert halls all have accessible seating which are typically empty spaces allowing for a wheelchair user to stay in their wheelchair. These spaces are on an accessible route and the wheelchair space must have an adjacent companion seat. Reasonable accommodations or modifications are changes, exceptions, or adjustments made to a rule, policy, practice, or service. Examples of accommodations could be having a store clerk assist by pushing a shopping cart for food shopping. Someone providing braille menu to someone who's blind is also an accommodation. If someone cannot read the menu, a reasonable accommodation would be for the menu to be read aloud and reviewed with the person. Requests that are not reasonable or required include assisting someone to try on new clothing at the store or feeding someone at the restaurant. Staff may provide assistance in cutting up the food for an individual, but it is not required to assist in eating. We have all seen electric shopping carts at our local grocery store or 
shopping centers. These carts do provide an accommodation for many people with physical disabilities, allowing them to shop independently. These carts are not required under the ADA. However, if the store does provide them, they are obligated to ensure they are properly stored, charged, and maintained. Likewise, I wanted to briefly discuss door openers. We know many of us rely on and prefer automatic doors. It is not a requirement under the federal or state guidelines that doors have automatic door or push button openers. What is required is that the door closures are calibrated properly to ensure the maximum opening force is not exceeded, which for interior doors, the maximum force is five pounds. So here are a few tips that I'm suggesting. First thing, speak up, ask for assistance, express your concern or findings that you believe are not quite right. Secondly, know your rights and responsibilities. When you experience something that feels wrong or feels it violates your right, do some research. I've attached two links to these fact sheets created by the US Department of Justice on service animals and effective communication, topics we discussed earlier. Materials such as this may be helpful and you can analyze your situation and either arm you with knowledge or confirm to you there is a bigger problem and you need some additional help. If you are deaf and need an interpreter, provide or suggest local interpreting agencies that makes the process easier for the other party. If you need a reasonable accommodation or modification, it is important that you know what that accommodation or modification is. Simply stating, I need a reasonable accommodation is insufficient. You must be able to express what it is that you need. Many of us have heard the phrase, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Well, there's some truth to that. I encourage, I encourage everyone to start the interactive communication process with politeness and kindness. Many times people will want to do the right thing if they are asked nicely, provided some general guidelines to, to what is needed and how to get it. And then of course, a thank you is always in style. For Title II entities, some of these examples, again, are state and local government, airports, hospitals, colleges, and universities. You can reach out for help or conflict resolution by contacting the local ADA coordinator, local human rights organizations, or risk management department. For Title III entities, and those are place, public places we all go, contact the manager, supervisor, CEO, administrator, and if necessary, up to the corporate office if it has one. Still need help or where to turn to? Here's some suggestions for you. The ADA hotline with the Department of Justice is an excellent resource. You can reach them at 800-514-0301 or visit their website at ada.gov. Gov. That's ADA.gov. The ADA National Network has 10 regional ADA centers across the United States to provide information, guidance, and training on the ADA. They can be reached at 800-949-4232 or at ADATA.org. And finally, the United States Access Board is an independent agency of the U.S. government devoted to accessibility for people with disabilities, and it was created in 1973 to ensure access to federally funded facilities. They also provide excellent guidance and te technical assistance. To contact them by phone, call 800-872-2253 or visit their website at access-board.gov. And of course, you can reach us if you need help. We can provide referrals, information, or if warranted, a more fully investigated matter. Please visit us online at www.disabilityrightsflorida.org or call us at 800-342-0823. Every year at this time, we start to seek public input, which helps us plan for next year. Your input is very valuable to us. 
please complete our online survey to let us know what your needs are as we plan our goals, priorities, and objectives for 2021. Our survey can be found at disabilityrightsflorida.org forward slash survey. Thank you so very much.